This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Fanny Hill by John Cleland. Part 2. About eleven at night, my two ladies came home, and having received rather a favourable account from Martha, who had run down to let them in, for Mr. Crofts, that was the name of my brute, was gone out of the house, after waiting till he had tired his patience for Mrs. Brown's return, they came thundering upstairs, and seeing me pale, my face bloody, and all the marks of the most thorough dejection, they employed themselves more to comfort and re-inspirit me than in making me the reproaches I was weak enough to fear, I who had so many juster and stronger to retort upon them. Mrs. Brown withdrawn, Phoebe came presently to bed to me, and what with the answers she drew from me, what with her own method of palpably satisfying herself, she soon discovered that I had been more frighted than hurt, upon which, I suppose, being herself seized with sleep, and reserving her lectures and instructions till the next morning, she left me, properly speaking, to my unrest. For after tossing and turning the greater part of the night, and tormenting myself with the falsest notions and apprehensions of things, I fell, through mere fatigue, into a kind of delirious doze, out of which I waded late in the morning, in a violent fever, a circumstance which was extremely critical to reprieve me, at least for a time, from the attacks of a wretch infinitely more terrible to me than death itself. The interested care that was taken of me during my illness, in order to restore me to a condition of making good the board's engagements, or of enduring further trials, and however such an effect on my grateful disposition that I even thought myself obliged to my undoers for their attention to promote my recovery, and above all for the keeping out of my sight of that brutal ravisher, the author of my disorder, on their finding I was too strongly moved at the bare mention of his name. Youth is soon raised, and a few days were sufficient to conquer the fury of my fever. But what contributed most to my perfect recovery, and to my reconciliation with life, was the timely news that Mr. Crofts, who was a merchant of considerable dealings, was arrested at the King's suit for nearly forty thousand pounds, on account of his driving a certain contraband trade, and that his affairs were so desperate that even were it in his inclination, it would not be in his power to renew his designs upon me, for he was instantly thrown into a prison, which it was not likely he would get out of in haste. Mrs. Brown, who had touched his fifty guineas, advanced to so little purpose and lost all hopes of the remaining hundred, began to look upon my treatment of him with a more favourable eye, and as they had observed my temper to be perfectly tractable and conformable to their views, all the girls that composed her flock were suffered to visit me, and had their cue to dispose me by their conversation to a perfect resignation of myself to Mrs. Brown's direction. Accordingly they were let in upon me, and all that frolic and thoughtless gaiety in which those giddy creatures consume their leisure made me envy a condition of which I only saw the fair side, insomuch that the being one of them became even my ambition, a disposition which they all carefully cultivated, and I wanted now nothing but to restore my health that I might be able to undergo the ceremony of the initiation. Conversation, example, all, in short, contributed in that house to corrupt my native purity, which had taken no root in education, whilst not the inflammable principle of pleasure so easily fired at my age, made strange work within me, and all the modesty I was brought up in the habit, not the instruction of, began to melt away like dew before the sun's heat, not to mention that I made a vice of necessity from the constant fears I had of being turned out to starve. I was soon pretty well recovered, and at certain hours allowed to range all over the house, but cautiously kept from seeing any company till the arrival of Lord B. from Bath, 
to whom Mrs. Brown, in respect to his experienced generosity on such occasions, proposed to offer the perusal of that trinket of mine which bears so great an imaginary value, and his lordship, being expected in town in less than a fortnight, Mrs. Brown judged I would be entirely renewed in beauty and freshness by that time, and afford her the chance of a better bargain than she had driven with Mr. Crofts. In the meantime I was so thoroughly, as they call it, brought over, so tame to their whistle, that had my cage-door been set open, I had no idea that I ought to fly anywhere, sooner than stay where I was, nor had I the least sense of regretting my condition, but waited very quietly for whatever Mrs. Brown should order concerning me, who on her side, by herself and her agents, took more than the necessary precautions to lull and lay asleep all just reflections on my destination. Preachments of morality over the left shoulder, a life of joy painted in the gayest colours, caresses, promises, indulgent treatment, nothing, in short, was wanting to domesticate me entirely, and to prevent my going out anywhere to get better advice. Alas, I dreamed of no such thing. Hitherto I had been indebted only to the girls of the house for the corruption of my innocence, their luscious talk, in which modesty was far from respected, their description of their engagements with men, had given me a tolerable insight into the nature and mysteries of their profession, at the same time that they highly provoked an itch of florid, warm-spirited blood through every vein. But above all, my bedfellow Phoebe, whose pupil I more immediately was, exerted her talents in giving me the first tinctures of pleasure, whilst nature, now warmed and wantoned with discoveries so interesting, piqued a curiosity which feebly artfully whetted, and, leading me from question to question of her own suggestion, explained to me all the mysteries of Venus. But I could not long remain in such a house as that, without being an eye-witness of more than I could conceive from her descriptions. One day, about twelve at noon, being thoroughly recovered of my fever, I happened to be in Mrs. Brown's dark closet, where I had not been half an hour, resting upon the maid's settled bed, before I heard a rustling in the bedchamber, separated from the closet only by two sash-doors, before the glasses of which were drawn two yellow damask curtains, but not so close as to exclude the full view of the room from any person in the closet. I instantly crept softly, and posted myself so that, seeing everything minutely, I could not myself be seen. And who should come in but the venerable mother abbess herself, handed in by a tall, brawny young horse-grenadier, moulded in the Hercules style, in fine the choice of the most experienced dame in those affairs, in all London. Oh, how still and hushed did I keep at my stand, lest any noise should balk my curiosity, or bring madam into the closet. But I had not much reason to fear either, for she was so entirely taken up with her present great concern, that she had no sense of attention to spare to anything else. Droll it was to see that clumsy fat figure of hers flop down on the foot of the bed, opposite to the closet door, so that I had a full front view of all her charms. Her paramour sat down by her. He seemed to be a man of very few words, and a great stomach. For proceeding instantly to essentials, he gave her some hearty smacks, and, thrusting his hands into her breasts, disengaged them from her stays, in scorn of whose confinement they broke loose and swagged down, navel low at least. A more enormous pair did my eyes never behold, nor of a worse colour, flagging soft and most lovingly contiguous. Yet, such as they were, this neck-beef-eater seemed to pour them with a most uninvitable gust, seeking in vain to confine or cover one of them with a hand scarce less than a shoulder of mutton. After toying with them thus some time, as if they had been worth it, he laid her down pretty briskly, and, canting up her petticoats, 
made barely a mask of them to her broad red face, that blushed with nothing but brandy. As he stood on one side, for a minute or so, unbuttoning his waistcoat and breeches, her fat, brawny thighs hung down, and the whole greasy landscape lay fairly open to my view. A wide, open-mouthed gap, overshaded with a grisly bush, seemed held out like a beggar's wallet for its provision. But I soon had my eyes called off by a more striking object, that entirely engrossed them. Her sturdy stallion had now unbuttoned, and produced naked, stiff, and erect, that wonderful machine which I had never seen before, and which, for the interest my own seat of pleasure began to take furiously in it, I stared at with all the eyes I had. However, my senses were too much flurried, too much consented in that now burning spot of mine, to observe anything more than in general the make and turn of that instrument from which the instinct of nature, yet more than all I had heard of it, now strongly informed me, I was to expect that supreme pleasure which she had placed in the meeting of those parts so admirably fitted for each other. Long, however, the young spark did not remain, before giving it two or three shakes, by way of brandishing it. He threw himself upon her, and his back being now towards me, I could only take his being engulfed, for granted, by the directions he moved in and the impossibility of missing so staring a mark. And now the bed shook, the curtains rattled so that I could scarce hear the sighs and murmurs, the heaves and pantings that accompanied the action, from the beginning to the end, the sound and sight of which thrilled to the very soul of me, and made every vein of my body circulate liquid fires. The emotion grew so violent that it almost intercepted my respiration. Prepared, then, and disposed as I was by the discourse of my companions, and Phoebe's minute detail of everything, no wonder that such a sight gave the last dying blow to my native innocence. Whilst they were in the heat of the action, guided by nature only, I stole my hand up my petticoats, and with fingers all on fire, seized and yet more inflamed that centre of all my senses. My heart palpitated, as if it would force its way through my bosom. I breathed with pain. I twisted my thighs, squeezed and compressed the lips of that virgin slit, and following mechanically the example of Phoebe's manual operations on it, as far as I could find admission, brought on at last the critical ecstasy, the melting flow, into which nature, spent with excess of pleasure, dissolves and dies away. After which my senses recovered coolness enough to observe the rest of the transaction between this happy pair. The young fellow had just dismounted, when the old lady immediately sprang up with all the vigour of youth, derived no doubt from her late refreshment, and making him sit down, began in her turn to kiss him, to pat and pinch his cheeks and play with his hair, all which he received with an air of indifference and coolness, that showed him to be much altered from what he was when he first went on to the breach. My pious governess, however, not being above calling in auxiliaries, unlocks a little case of cordials that stood near the bed, and made him pledge her in a very plentiful dram. After which, and a little amorous parley, Madame sat herself down upon the same place, at the bed's foot, and the young fellow, standing sideways by her, she, with the greatest effrontery imaginable, unbuttons his breeches, and removing his shirt, draws out his affair, so shrunk and diminished that I could not but remember the difference, now crestfallen, or just faintly lifting its head. But our experienced matron, very soon, by chafing it with her hands, brought it to swell to that size and erection I had before seen it up to. I admired then, upon a fresh account, and with a nicer survey, the texture of that capital part of man, the flaming red head as it stood uncapped, the whiteness of the shaft, and the shrub growth of curling hair that embrowned the roots of it, the roundish bag that dangled down from it, all exacted my eager attention, and renewed my flame. But as the main affair was now at the point the industrious dame had laboured to bring it to, she was not in the humour to put off the payment of her pains, but laying herself down, drew him gently upon her, and thus they finished in the same manner as before, the old last act. This over, they both went out lovingly together, 
the old lady having first made him a present, as near as I could observe, of three or four pieces, he being not only her particular favourite on account of his performances, but a retainer to the house, from whose sight she had taken great care hitherto to secrete me, lest he might not have had the patience to wait for my lord's arrival, but have insisted on being his taster, which the old lady was under too much subjection to him to dare dispute with him, for every girl of the house fell to him in course, and the old lady only now and then got her turn, in consideration of the maintenance he had, and which he could scarce be accused of not earning from her. As soon as I heard them go downstairs, I stole up softly to my own room, out of which I had luckily not been missed. There I began to breathe freer, and to give a loose to those warm emotions which the sight of such an encounter had raised in me. I laid me down on the bed, stretched myself out, joining and ardently wishing, and requiring any means to divert or allay the rekindled rage and tumult of my desires, which all pointed strongly to their pole, man. I felt about the bed, as if I sought for something that I grasped in my waking dream, and not finding it could have cried for vexation, every part of me glowing with stimulating fires. At length I resorted to the only present remedy, that of vain attempts at digitation, where the smallness of the theatre did not yet afford room enough for action, and where the pain my fingers gave me in striving for admission, though they procured me a slight satisfaction for the present, started an apprehension which I could not be easy till I had communicated to Phoebe, and received her explanations upon it. The opportunity, however, did not offer till the next morning, for Phoebe did not come to bed till long after I was gone to sleep. As soon, then, as we were both awake, it was but in course to bring our lyre-bed chat to land on the subject of my uneasiness, to which a recital of the love-scene I had thus by chance been spectatress of served for a preface. Phoebe could not hear it to the end without more than one interruption by peals of laughter, and my ingenuous way of relating matters did not a little heighten the joke to her. But on her sounding me how the sight had affected me, without mincing or hiding the pleasurable emotions it had inspired me with, I told her at the same time that one remark had perplexed me, and that very considerably. I says she, what was that? Why, replied I, having very curiously and attentively compared the size of that enormous machine, which did not appear, at least to my fearful imagination, less than my wrist, and at least three of my handfuls long, to that of the tender small part of me which was framed to receive it, I cannot conceive its being possible to afford it entrance without dying, perhaps in the greatest pain, since you well know that even a finger thrust in there hurts me beyond bearing. As to my mistresses and yours, I can plainly distinguish the different dimensions of them from mine, palpable to the touch, and visible to the eye, so that in short, great as the promised pleasure may be, I am afraid of the pain of the experiment. Phoebe, at this, redoubled her laugh, and whilst I expected a very serious solution of my doubts and apprehensions in this matter, only told me that she never heard of a mortal wound being given in those parts by that terrible weapon, and that some she knew younger and as delicately made as myself had outlived the operation, that she believed at the worst I should take a great deal of killing, that true as it was, there was a great diversity of sizes in those parts, owing to nature, child-bearing, frequent overstretching with unmerciful machines, but that at a certain age and habit of body even the most experienced in those affairs could not well distinguish between the maid and the woman, supposing, too, an absence of all artifice, and things in their natural situation, but that since chance had thrown in my way one sight of that sort, she would procure me another, that should feast my eyes more delicately, and go a great way in the cure of my fears from that imaginary disproportion. On this she asked me if I knew Polly Phillips. Undoubtedly, says I, the fair girl which was so tender of me when I was sick, and has been, as you told me, but two months in the house. The same, says Phoebe. You must know, then, she is kept by a young Genoese merchant, whom his uncle, who is immensely rich, and whose darling he is, 
sent over here with an English merchant, his friend, on a pretext of settling some accounts, but in reality to humour his inclinations for travelling and seeing the world. He met casually with this Polly once in company, and, taking a liking to her, makes it worth her while to keep entirely to him. He comes to her here twice or thrice a week, and she receives him in her light closet, up one pair of stairs, where he enjoys her, in a taste, I suppose, peculiar to the heat, or perhaps the caprices of his own country. I say no more, but to-morrow, being his day, you shall see what passes between them, from a place only known to your mistress and myself. You may be sure, in the ply I was now taking, I had no objection to the proposal, and was rather a tiptoe for its accomplishment. At five in the evening, next day, Phoebe, punctual to her promise, came to me as I sat alone in my own room, and beckoned me to follow her. We went down the back stairs very softly, and opening the door of a dark closet, where there was some old furniture kept, and some cases of liquor, she drew me in after her, and fastening the door upon us, we had no light but what came through a long crevice in the partition between ours and the light closet, where the scene of action lay, so that sitting on those low cases we could, with the greatest ease, as well as clearness, see all objects, ourselves unseen, only by applying our eyes close to the crevice, where the moulding of a panel had warped or started a little, on the other side. The young gentleman was the first person I saw, with his back directly towards me, looking at a print. Polly was not yet come. In less than a minute, though, the door opened, and she came in, and at the noise the door made, he turned about, and came to meet her, with an air of the greatest tenderness and satisfaction. After saluting her, he led her to a couch that fronted us, where they both sat down, and the young Genoese helped her to a glass of wine, with some Naples biscuit on a salver. Presently, when they had exchanged a few kisses, and questions in broken English on one side, he began to unbutton, and in fine stripped to his shirt. As if this had been the signal agreed on for pulling off all their clothes, a scheme which the heat of the season perfectly favoured, Polly began to draw her pins, and as she had no stays to unlace, she was in a trice, with her gallant's officious assistance, undressed to all but her shift. When he saw this, his breeches were immediately loosened, waist and knee-bands, and slipped over his ankles, clean off. His shirt-collar was unbuttoned, too. Then, first giving Polly an encouraging kiss, he stole, as it were, the shift off the girl, who, being, I suppose, broke and familiarised to this humour, blushed indeed, but less than I did at the apparition of her, now standing stark naked, just as she came out of the hands of pure nature, with her black hair loose and afloat down her dazzling white neck and shoulders, whilst the deepened carnation of her cheeks went off gradually into the hue of glazed snow, for such were the blended tints and polish of her skin. This girl could not be above eighteen, her face regular and sweet-featured, her shape exquisite, nor could I help envying her two ripe, enchanting breasts, finely plumped out in flesh, but withal so round, so firm, that they sustained themselves in scorn of any stay, then their nipples, pointing different ways, marked their pleasing separation. Between them lay the delicious tract of the belly, which terminated in a parting or rift scarce discernible, that modestly seemed to retire downwards, and seek shelter between two plump fleshy thighs. The curling black hair that overspread its delightful front clothed it with the richest sable fur in the universe. In short, she was evidently a subject for the painters to court her sitting to them, for a pattern of female beauty, in all the true price and pomp of nakedness. The young Italian, still in his shirt, stood gazing and transported at the sight of beauties that might have fired a dying hermit. His eager eyes devoured her, as she shifted attitudes at his discretion. Neither were his hands excluded their share of the high feast, but wandered on the hunt of pleasure over every part and inch of her body so qualified to afford the most exquisite sense of it. In the meantime, one could not help observing the swell of his shirt before, that 
bolstered out and showed the condition of things behind the curtain. But he soon removed it by slipping his shirt over his head, and now, as to nakedness, they had nothing to reproach one another. The young gentleman, by Phoebe's guess, was about two and twenty, tall and well-limbed. His body was finely formed, and of a most vigorous make, square-shouldered and broad-chested. His face was not remarkable in any way, but for a nose inclined to the Roman, eyes large, black, and sparkling, and a ruddiness in his cheeks that was the more a grace, for his complexion was of the brownest, not of that dusky dun colour which excludes the idea of freshness, but of that clear olive gloss which glowing with life dazzles perhaps less than fairness, and yet pleases more when it pleases at all. His hair, being too short to tie, fell no lower than his neck, in short easy curls, and he had a few sprigs about his paps that garnished his chest in a style of strength and manliness. Then his great movement, which seemed to rise out of a thicket of curling hair that spread from the root all round thighs and bellies up to the navel, stood stiff and upright, but of a size to frighten me by sympathy for the small tender part which was the object of its fury and which now lay exposed to my fairest view. For he had, immediately on stripping off his shirt, gently pushed her down on the couch, which stood conveniently to break her willing fall. Her thighs were spread out to their utmost extension, and discovered between them the mark of the sex, the red-centred cleft of flesh whose lips, vermilioning inwards, expressed a small rubied line in sweet miniature, such as Guido's touch of colouring could never attain to the life or delicacy of. Phoebe, at this, gave me a gentle jog to prepare me for a whispered question, whether I thought my little maidenhead was much less. But my attention was too much engrossed, too much enwrapped with all I saw, to be able to give her any answer. By this time the young gentleman had changed her posture from lying breadth to lengthwise on the couch, but her thighs were still spread, and the mark lay fair for him, who now, kneeling between them, displayed to us a side view of that fierce erect machine of his, which threatened no less than splitting the tender victim, who lay smiling at the uplifted stroke, nor seemed to decline it. He looked upon his weapon himself with some pleasure, and guiding it with his hand to the inviting slit, drew aside the lips, and lodged it, after some thrusts which Polly seemed even to assist, about half-way, but there it stuck, I suppose from its growing thickness. He draws it again, and, just wetting it with spittle, re-enters, and, with ease, sheathed it now up to the hilt, at which Polly gave a deep sigh, which was quite another tone than one of pain. He thrusts, she heaves, at first gently, and in a regular cadence, but presently the transport began to be too violent to observe any order or measure. Their motions were too rapid, their kisses too fierce and fervent for nature to support such fury long. Both seemed to me out of themselves. Their eyes darted fires. Oh, oh, I, I can't bear it! It's too much! I die! I'm going! were Polly's expressions of ecstasy. His joys were more silent, but soon broken murmurs, sighs heart-fetched, and at length a dispatching thrust, as if he would have forced himself up her body, and then motionless languor of all his limbs, all showed that the die-away moment was come upon him, which she gave signs of joining with, by the wild throwing of her hands about, closing her eyes and giving a deep sob, in which she seemed to expire in an agony of bliss. When he had finished his stroke, and got off from her, she lay still without the least motion, breathless, as it should seem, with pleasure. He replaced her again breadthwise on the couch, unable to sit up, with her thighs open, between which I could observe a kind of white liquid, like froth, hanging about the outward lips of that recently opened wound, which now glowed with a deeper red. Presently she gets up, and throwing her arms round him, seemed far away from undelighted with the trial he had put her to, to judge at least by the fondness with which she eyed and hung upon him. For my part, I will not pretend to describe what I felt all over me during this scene, but from that instant 
adieu all fears of what man could do unto me, they were now changed into such ardent desires, such ungovernable longings, that I could have pulled the first of that sex that should present himself by the sleeve, and offered him the bauble which I now imagined the loss of would be a gain I could not too soon procure myself. Phoebe, who had more experience, and to whom such sights were not so new, could not, however, be unmoved at so warm a scene, and drawing me away softly from the peephole, for fear of being overheard, guided me as near the door as possible, all passive and obedient, to her least signals. Here was no room either to sit or lie, but making me stand with my back towards the door, she lifted up my petticoats, and with her busy fingers fell to visit and explore that part of me where now the heat and irritations were so violent that I was perfectly sick and ready to die with desire, that the bare touch of her finger in that critical place had the effect of a fire to a train, and her hand instantly made her sensible to what a pitch I was wound up and melted by the sight she had thus procured me. Satisfied then with her success in allaying a heat that would have made me impatient of seeing the continuation of the transactions between our amorous couple, she brought me again to the crevice, so favourable to our curiosity. We had certainly been but a few instants away from it, and yet on our return we saw everything in good forwardness for recommencing the tender hostilities. The young foreigner was sitting down, fronting us, on the couch, with Polly upon one knee, who had her arms around his neck whilst the extreme whiteness of her skin was not undelightfully contrasted by the smooth, glossy brown of her lover's. But who could count the fierce, unnumbered kisses, given and taken, in which I could often discover their exchanging the velvet thrust, when both their mouths were double-tongued, and seemed to favour the mutual insertion with the greatest gust and delight? In the meantime his red-headed champion, that has so lately fled the pit, quelled and abashed, was now recovered to the top of his condition, perked and crested up between Polly's thighs, who was not wanting on her part to coax and deep it in good humour, stroking it with her head down, and receiving even its velvet tip between the lips of not its proper mouth. Whether she did this out of any particular pleasure, or whether it was to render it more glib and easy of entrance, I could not tell, but it had such an effect that the young gentleman seemed by his eyes, that sparkled with more excited lustre, and his inflamed countenance, to receive increase of pleasure. He got up, and taking Polly in his arms, embraced her, and said something too softly for me to hear, leading her withal to the foot of the couch, and taking delight to slap her thighs and posteriors with that stiff sinew of his, which hit them with a spring that he gave it with his hand, and made them resound again, but hurt her about as much as he meant to hurt her, for she seemed to have as frolic a taste as himself. But guess my surprise, when I saw the lazy young rogue lie down on his back, and gently pull down Polly upon him, who giving way to his humour straddled, and with her hands conducted her blind favourite to the right place and following her impulse ran directly upon the flaming point of this weapon of pleasure, which she staked herself upon, up-pierced and infixed to the extremest hair-breadth of it. Thus she sat on him a few instants, enjoying and relishing her situation, whilst he toyed with her provoking breasts. Sometimes she would stoop to meet his kiss, but presently the sting of pleasure spurred them up to fiercer action, then began the storm of heaves, which from the undermost combatant were thrusts at the same time, he crossing his hands over her, and drawing her home to him with a sweet violence. The inverted strokes of anvil over hammer soon brought on the critical period, in which all the signs of a close conspiring ecstasy informed us of the point they were at. For me, I could bear to see no more. I was so overcome, so inflamed at the second part of the same play, that, mad to an intolerable degree, I hugged, I clasped Phoebe, as if she had wherewithal to relieve me, pleased, however, with, and pitying the taking she could feel me in. She drew me towards the door, and opening it as softly as she could, we both got off undiscovered, and she reconducted me to my own room, where, unable to keep my legs, in the agitation I was in, I instantly threw myself down on the bed, where I lay transported, 
though ashamed at what I felt. Phoebe lay down by me, and asked me archly if, now that I had seen the enemy, and fully considered him, I was still afraid of him, or did I think I could venture to come to a close engagement with him, to all which not a word on my side. I sighed, and could scarce breathe. She takes hold of my hand, and having rolled up her own petticoats, forced it half strivingly towards those parts where, now grown more knowing, I missed the main object of my wishes, and finding not even the shadow of what I wanted, where everything was so flat or so hollow, in the vexation I was in at it, I should have withdrawn my hand, but for fear of disobliging her. Abandoning it then entirely to her management, she made use of it as she thought proper, to procure herself rather the shadow than the substance of any pleasure. For my part, I now pined for more solid food, and promised tacitly to myself that I would not be put off much longer with this foolery from woman to woman, if Mrs. Brown did not soon provide me with the essential specific. In short, I had all the air of not being able to wait the arrival of my Lord B., though he was now expected in a very few days. Nor did I wait for him, for love itself took charge of the disposal of me, in spite of interest or gross lust. It was now two days after the closet scene that I got up about six in the morning, and, leaving my bedfellow fast asleep, stole down with no other thought than that of taking a little fresh air in a small garden, which our back parlour opened into, and from which my confinement debarred me at the times company came to the house. But now sleep and silence reigned all over it. I opened the parlour door, and well surprised was I at seeing, by the side of a fire half out, a young gentleman in the old lady's elbow chair, with his legs laid upon another, fast asleep, and left there by his thoughtless companions, who had drank him down, and then went off with every one his mistress, while he stayed behind by the courtesy of the old matron, who would not disturb or turn him out in that condition at one in the morning. And beds, it is more than probable, there were none to spare. On the table still remained the punch-bowl and glasses, strewn about in their usual disorder, after a drunken revel. But when I drew nearer, to view the sleeping one, heavens, what a sight! No! No term of years, no turn of fortune, could ever erase the lightning-like impression his form made on me. Yes, dearest object of my earliest passion, I command for ever the remembrance of thy first appearance to my ravished eyes. It calls thee up, present, and I see thee now. Figure to yourself, madam, a fair stripling, between eighteen and nineteen, with his head reclined on one of the sides of the chair, his hair in disordered curls, irregularly shading a face on which all the roseate bloom of youth and all the manly graces conspired to fix my eyes and heart, even the languor and paleness of his face, in which the momentary triumph of the lily over the rose was owing to the excesses of the night, gave an inexpressible sweetness to the finest features imaginable. His eyes, closed in sleep, displayed the meeting edges of their lids beautifully bordered with long eyelashes, over which no pencil could have described two more regular arches than those that graced his forehead, which was high, perfectly white and smooth than a pair of vermilion lips, pouting and swelling to the touch, as if a bee had freshly stung them, seemed to challenge me to get the gloves off this lovely sleeper, had not the modesty and respect which in both sexes are inseparable from a true passion checked my impulses. But on seeing his shirt-collar unbuttoned, and a bosom whiter than a drift of snow, the pleasure of considering it could not bribe me to lengthen it at the hazard of a health that began to be my life's concern. Love that made me timid, taught me to be tender too. With a trembling hand I took hold of one of his, and waking him as gently as possible, he started, and looking at first a little wildly, said with a voice that sent its harmonious sound to my heart, Pray, child, 
"'What o'clock is it?' I told him, and added that he might catch cold if he slept longer with his breast open in the cool of the morning air. On this he thanked me with a sweetness perfectly agreeing with that of his features and eyes. The last, now broad open, and eagerly surveying me, carried the sprightly fires they sparkled with directly to my heart. It seemed that, having drank too freely before he came upon the rake with some of his young companions, he had put himself out of a condition to go through all the weapons with them, and crown the night with getting a mistress, so that seeing me in a loose undress, he did not doubt but I was one of the misses of the house, sent in to repair his loss of time. But though he seized that notion, and a very obvious one it was, without hesitation, yet, whether my figure made a more than ordinary impression on him, or whether it was natural politeness, he addressed me in a manner far from rude, though still on the foot of one of the house pliers come to amuse him, and giving me the first kiss that I ever relished from man in my life, asked me if I would favour him with my company, assuring me that he would make it worth my while, but had not even new-born love, that true refiner of lust, opposed so sudden a surrender, the fear of being surprised by the house was a sufficient bar to my compliance. I told him then, in a tone set me by love itself, that for reasons I had not time to explain to him, I could not stay with him, and might not even ever see him again, with a sigh at these last words, which broke from the bottom of my heart. My conqueror, who, as he afterwards told me, had been struck with my appearance, and liked me as much as he could think of liking any one in my supposed way of life, asked me briskly at once if I would be kept by him, and that he would take a lodging for me directly, and relieve me from any engagements he presumed I might be under to the house. Rash, sudden, undigested, and even dangerous as his offer might be from a perfect stranger, and that stranger a giddy boy, the prodigious love I was struck with for him had put a charm into his voice there was no resisting, and blinded me to every objection. I could, at that instant, have died for him. Think if I could resist an invitation to live with him. Thus my heart, beating strong to the proposal, dictated my answer, after scarce a minute's pause, that I would accept of his offer, and make my escape to him in what way he pleased, and that I would be entirely at his disposal, let it be good or bad. I have often since wondered that so great an easiness did not disgust him, or make me too cheap in his eyes. But my fate had so appointed it, that in his fears of the hazard of the town, he had been some time looking out for a girl to take into keeping, and my person happening to hit his fancy, it was by one of those miracles reserved to love that we struck the bargain in the instant, which we sealed by an exchange of kisses, that the hopes of a more uninterrupted enjoyment engaged him to content himself with. Never, however, did dear youth carry in his person more wherewith to justify the turning of a girl's head, and making her set all consequences at defiance for the sake of following a gallant. For besides all the perfections of manly beauty which were assembled in his form, he had an air of neatness and gentility, a certain smartness in the carriage and port of his head, that yet more distinguished him. His eyes were sprightly and full of meaning, his looks had in them something at once sweet and commanding. His complexion outbloomed the lovely coloured rose, whilst its inimitable tender vivid glow clearly saved from the reproach of wanting life of raw and doe-like, which is commonly made to those so extremely fair as he was. Our little plan was that I should get out about seven the next morning, which I could readily promise, as I knew where to get the key of the street door, and he would wait at the end of the street with a coach to convey me safe off, after which he would send and clear any debt incurred by my stay at Mrs. Brown's, who, he only judged in gross, might not care to part with one he thought so fit to draw custom to the house. I then just hinted to him 
not to mention in the house his having seen such a person as me, for reasons I would explain to him more at leisure. And then, for fear of miscarrying, by being seen together, I tore myself from him with a bleeding heart, and stole up softly to my room, where I found Phoebe still fast asleep, and hurrying off my few clothes, lay down by her, with a mixture of joy and anxiety that may be easier conceived than expressed. The risks of Mrs. Brown's discovering my purpose, of disappointments, misery, ruin, all vanished before this new kindled flame, the seeing, the touching, the being, if but for a night with this idol of my fond virgin heart, appeared to me a happiness above the purchase of my liberty or life. He might use me ill. Let him. He was the master. Happy, too happy, even to receive death at so dear a hand. To this purpose were the reflections of the whole day, of which every minute seemed to me a little eternity. How often did I visit the clock, nay, was tempted to advance the tedious hand, as if that would have advanced the time with it. Had those of the house made the least observations on me, they must have remarked something extraordinary from the discomposure I could not help betraying, especially when at dinner mention was made of the charmingest youth having been there, and stayed breakfast. Oh, he was such a beauty! I should have died for him. They would pull caps for him, and the like fooleries, which, however, was throwing oil on a fire I was sorely put to it to smother the blaze of. The fluctuations of my mind, the whole day, produced one good effect, which was that, through mere fatigue, I slept tolerably well till five in the morning, when I got up, and having dressed myself, waited under the double tortures of fear and impatience for the appointed hour. It came at last, the dear, critical, dangerous hour came, and now, supported only by the courage love lent me, I ventured a tiptoe downstairs, leaving my box behind for fear of being surprised with it in going out. I got to the street door, the key whereof was always laid on the chair by our bedside, in trust with Phoebe, who, having not the least suspicion of my entertaining any design to go from them, nor, indeed, had I but the day before, made no reserve or concealment of it from me. I opened the door with great ease. Love that emboldened protected me too, and now, got safe into the street, I saw my new guardian angel waiting at a coach door, ready open. How I got to him I know not. I suppose I flew, but I was in the coach in a trice, and he by the side of me, with his arms clasped round me, and giving me the kiss of welcome. The coachman had his orders, and drove to them. My eyes were instantly filled with tears, but tears of the most delicious delight. To find myself in the arms of the most beauteous youth was a rapture that my little heart swam in. Past or future were equally out of the question with me. The present was as much as all my powers of life were sufficient to bear the transport of, without fainting. Nor were the most tender embraces the most soothing expressions wanting on his side, to assure me of his love, and of never giving me cause to repent the bold step I had taken, in throwing myself thus entirely upon his honour and generosity. But alas! This was no merit in me, for I was drove to it by a passion too impetuous for me to resist, and I did what I did, because I could not help it. In an instant, for time was now annihilated with me, we landed at a public house in Chelsea, hospitably commodious for the reception of duet parties of pleasure, where a breakfast of chocolate was prepared for us. An old jolly stager who kept it, and understood life perfectly well, breakfasted with us, and leering archly at me, gave us both joy, and said we were well paired, in faith, that a great many gentlemen and ladies used his house, but he had never seen a handsomer couple. 
he was sure I was a fresh piece. I looked so country, so innocent. Well, my spouse was a lucky man. All which common landlords cant not only pleased and soothed me, but helped to divert my confusion at being with my new sovereign, whom, now the minute approached, I began to fear to be alone with, a timidity which true love had a greater share in than even maiden bashfulness. I wished, I doted, I could have died for him, and yet, I know not how or why, I dreaded the point which had been the object of my fiercest wishes. My pulses beat fears, amidst a flush of the warmest desires. This struggle of the passions, however, this conflict betwixt modesty and lovesick longings, made me burst again into tears, which he took, as he had done before, only for the remains of concern, and emotion at the suddenness of my change of condition in committing myself to his care, and in consequence of that idea did and said all that he thought would most comfort and re-inspirit me. After breakfast, Charles, the dear familiar name I must take the liberty henceforward to distinguish my Adonis by, with a smile full of meaning, took me gently by the hand, and said, Come, my dear, I will show you a room that commands a fine prospect over some gardens, and without waiting for an answer, in which he relieved me extremely, he led me up into a chamber, airy and lightsome, where all seeing of prospects was out of the question, except that of a bed, which had all the air of having recommended the room to him. Charles had just slipped the bolt of the door, and running caught me in his arms, and lifted me from the ground with his lips glued to mine, bore me trembling, panting, dying, with soft fears and tender wishes to the bed, where his impatience would not suffer him to undress me, more than just unpinning my handkerchief and gown, and unlacing my stays. My bosom was now bare, and rising in the warmest throbs presented to his sight and feeling, the firm hard swell of a pair of young breasts, such as may be imagined of a girl not sixteen, fresh out of the country, and never before handled, but even their pride, whiteness, fashion, pleasing resistance to the touch, could not bribe his restless hands from roving, but giving them the loose, my petticoats and shift were soon taken up, and their stronger centre of attraction laid open to their tender invasion. My fears, however, made me mechanically close my thighs, but the very touch of his hand insinuated between them, disclosed them, and opened a way for the main attack. In the meantime I lay fairly exposed to the examination of his eyes and hands, quiet and unresisting, which confirmed him the opinion he proceeded so cavalierly upon that I was no novice in these matters, since he had taken me out of a common bawdy house, nor had I said one thing to prepossess him of my virginity, and if I had, he would sooner have believed that I took him for a cully that would swallow such an improbability, than that I was still mistress of that darling treasure, that hidden mine, so eagerly sought after by the men and which they never dig for but to destroy. Being now too high wound up to bear a delay, he unbuttoned, and drawing out the engine of love assaults, drove it currently as at a ready-made breach. Then, then for the first time, did I feel that stiff, horn-hard gristle battering against the tender part. But imagine to yourself his surprise when he found after several vigorous pushes, which hurt me extremely, that he made not the least impression. I complained, but tenderly complained, that I could not bear it. Indeed, he hurt me. Still he thought no more than that, being so young, the largeness of his machine, for few men could dispute size with him, made all the difficulty, and that possibly I had not been enjoyed by any so advantageously made in that part as himself, for still that my virgin flower was yet uncropped, never entered into his head, and he would have thought it idling with time and words to have questioned me upon it. He tries again, still no admittance, still no penetration, 
but he had hurt me yet more, while my extreme love made me bear extreme pain almost without a groan. At length, after repeated fruitless trials, he lay down panting by me, kissed my falling tears, and asked me tenderly what was the meaning of so much complaining, and if I had not borne it better from others than I did from him. I answered, with a simplicity framed to persuade, that he was the first man that ever served me so. Truth is powerful, and it is not always that we do not believe what we eagerly wish. End of part two.